Ahmed, this young guy, before he got old, being a student, telling his friends, we need to go to this teacher, Imam al-Shafi. Because if we miss these classes, I don't think we'll be able to make it up. And so he used to study with Imam al-Shafi, and they had a very close bond between them, Imam al-Shafi and Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah. And just so you understand, all throughout the madhahib, even though the lay people come later and they think as if there's these big fights between the madhabs, when you go back to the asl, they were all brothers of one another. You had students of each other and they became so strong that their own fiqh legacy went forward. But they were students of one another. And just as a side point here, sometimes a person says, for example, Shias are like a fifth madhab. Which is not true. I asked one of our usul of fiqh teachers in Medina University, I said, why can't it just be a fiqh madhab? And he said that there was one fundamental difference. The fundamental difference is that the a'imma of the four madhahib, each one of them prays for the other. Each one of them, their love and their rahmah is there. And they were students of one another. Whereas when someone comes, almost like, hey, I'm a friend too, but it's not the same relationship. Because there are fundamental differences there in the legacy of the fiqh. So there's not um, an analogy between these madhahibs and their relationship and how other people will say we're just like the four madhahibs. There is fundamental difference. Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah, not only was Imam Ahmed impressed with him, but Imam al-Shafi rahimahullah was also impressed with Ahmed. So it's student and teacher and they're both impressed with each other. And he said, Rahimahullah, Imam Shafi said about Imam Ahmed, that I saw someone in Baghdad, that when he speaks, everybody who listens to him says, Sadaqt, you have told the truth. Because of the strength of his intelligence and the strength of his fiqh. And so you'll see Imam Ahmed, he worked hard and traveled far and went near and went east and west to compile the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam. If anybody's ever seen uh, Musnad Imam Ahmad, the Musnad, the compilation of Hadith, it's one of the most enormous books you may have ever seen in your life, if you saw it. The amount of a Hadith that he had to work with. And that just in terms, when you're looking at different madhabs, it wasn't that people were purposely turning their backs against the Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, but in many cases, a Hadith didn't come to them. So for example, someone would come to Imam Abu Hanifa, ask a question. Imam Abu Hanifa may have used Qiyas because he didn't have the Hadith. And so this student, he came and he told Abu Hanifa, I heard so and so narrate that the Prophet ﷺ said this regarding this issue. And Abu Hanifa was quiet and this person said, I had to leave. He said, I returned to Iraq 10 years later. And I heard people asking Imam Abu Hanifa about the issue and he was narrating the hadith that I told him. He said, فَعَلِمْتُ أَنَّهُ And so I knew that he was someone who followed the sunnah. And so this was their legacy again that they followed. And when you come to Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, because of his background in hadith, you see that he had enormous amount, a collection of hadith to work with. And you see, alhamdulillah, that a lot of the fiqh and Imam Ahmed's madhab is very closely attached to the ahadith that he had narrated. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, when someone is that close to hadith, it almost becomes a part of their, I can say, of their makeup. So their bones and their body, it's the hadith and their knowledge of the hadith mixes with that very tightly. So much so that they become so familiar with it. And Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he said that there wasn't a single hadith then I narrated and compiled, except that I tried my best to practice that hadith. Act upon it. If even once, that you will be min ahl al-hadith, of the people that follow the hadith. And so that was their legacy also. They learned things and they implemented. It wasn't just about compiling um, information, but it was about living their lives themselves and teaching it to others. You'll see also that legacy of how the parents used to take care of these children and they became the imams that we know. They also educated their children in such a way. And so you'll see that they grew up in homes of knowledge. In fact, generations of ulama. Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, his son was a great scholar also. 
Abdullah. And when I read this story about his relationship with Abdullah, I imagined how people, they go, come on boy, let's go play some ball. They take their little boy outside, you take a glove, I take a glove, and he throws a ball at the boy, the boy throws a ball. Hopefully one day he will grow up to be a great uh, baseball player. Like, who cares, right? Now, you see Imam Ahmed with his son playing, I would call, hadith ball. What would happen was that he would say to his son, look, let's play a game. I will say the hadith and you say the isnad. Then you say a hadith and I will say the isnad. Yalla, let's play. And so Abdullah says, you know, قَالَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. Imam Ahmed says, حَدَّثَنِي so and so on, so and so on, so Okay, your turn. And they would go back and forth, back and forth like this, each one getting stronger, learning with each other, father and son relationship. And so the exact words of um, his son Abdullah, he says, and he would teach his students this, that he says, when I was younger, my father would play with me. He would say, take any chapter you wish from the Musannaf of Waqiyah. Ask me any hadith and I'll tell you the chain of narrators or tell me any chain of narrators and I'll tell you the hadith. And this is the games that he used to play when he was young with his son so his son would become stronger. And one thing you also see in this is that Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, didn't forget his family. And he still took care of them. A lot of times people get involved in da'wah activities and they have to go to halaqahs. And maybe sometimes the people that never get any da'wah are that person's own family. But you see that in the legacy of the ulama that came before us that they didn't forget their family. And they took care of their family and they educated. And in many cases, their sons, their children, they also became scholars and well-known. One thing that we also see from this is that the ulama used to act in the way that they wanted their children to be. They used to act in a way that they wanted their children to be. So it wasn't a father saying, go do this because I'm just too old to do it myself. They wouldn't do that. If something was halal or haram for them or important for them, it was important for their son. If it was important for their son, it was important for them. And you see that happening again and again. And just reflecting on that, sometimes parents... They might have movies in their house. And as you go through these legacies, you say, who has time to watch movies now anymore, right? Sometimes a parent will say that this is the movie, this is R-rated, and this is uh, rated G. This is general for the children, and this is only for the adults. So they tell the children, look, only the adults can watch this. But you children can't watch it. And as one sister said, in our house, everything is one rating. Meaning that if it's haram for the children to watch it, it's haram for the parents to watch it also. There's no discrepancy, there's no difference between the two. And then the children are educated properly. And that's the proper way that a person should teach their children. We also see a focus in all of the ulama that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed on their ibadat. So again, it wasn't a focus just on teaching, but they spent their time in qiyamul layl, they spent their time in giving sadaqah. They spent their time fasting. And they lived their lives like that in the worship of Allah Azza wa Jal. Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, and we mentioned this earlier, but once a student came to his home and he put water out for him. And throughout the night, he left the water so that that student could use the water to go and make wudu so he could pray qiyamul layl. He came in the morning and the wudu water wasn't used. And Imam Ahmed was shocked at this. Because to him, it wasn't imaginable that someone would call themselves a student of knowledge and not pray Qiyamul Layl. And so he said, عَجِبْتُ مِنْ طَالِبِ عِلْمٍ لَا يَقُومُ Layl. And indeed, when people are thinking, I want to study Islam, I want to go overseas, I want to do this. This is the path to that knowledge. It's in coming closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. And when someone comes closer to Allah Azza wa Jal, then that tawfiq of being able to attend those classes and finding the path is made easy for them. And as we saw with all the other ulama, wherever they were, there was always the fitna of the debates and the rhetoric and ilm al-kalam that was going on in Iraq. And this was where Imam Ahmad rahimahullah was. And so in that atmosphere, you had people that were always trying to ask questions to cause trouble and so on and so forth. One of the things in the debates and issues that came up 
is that Imam Ahmed was of the opinion that camel meat breaks a person's wudu. And out of the four madhabs, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, was the only one that held this opinion. Because he's had some ahadith that he considered authentic, that camel meat breaks a person's wudu. And the others said, no, no type of meat um, breaks a person's wudu. So the people asked him a question. And it's interesting, this question actually is said to a lot of people about, you know, the wiping of the socks. They say, what if you see someone wiping their socks, and then they go and lead the prayer, would you pray behind them? And they're like, they're not my madhab, I wouldn't pray behind them. So they said this to Imam Ahmed. So the student, people like this were actually from a long time ago they existed. They said to Imam Ahmed, what if you had lunch with someone who ate camel meat? And then they got up and led the prayer without making wudu. Atusalli khalfa. Would you pray behind that person? Imam Ahmed knew what they were asking about. He said in reply, Afala usalli wara malik. 